<laughs> I know the video's off, but if she sees you, that'd be hilarious. Video oh, is off. Oh. We can't see you. <laughs> you can't see me? No, I can see you, but the oh. but um Hedges or Paul, we can't see you. I think they know yeah. the screen's off. <laughs> Awesome. Sorry, Frankie, you're too young for booze. No. <laughs> dogs aren't allowed to drink. Mm -mm. No, I don't know. The good dogs can. <laughs> <laughs> As mine's looking at me like, what'd you say? <laughs> Drink, what, huh? Booze? Can I just say this is like the cutest, but most adorable and awesome thing ever? It's a oh, good, good setup. Good, it was super, and it's so fun to set up. I was setting mine up and I was like, this is, we love the little, like the little, the curated box that we used this time. It worked out really, really well. Show them. I feel like the aperture on my camera is having a seizure. It keeps getting brighter and darker and brighter and darker. <laughs> okay. I'm so excited to taste these. So Amanda, if you still want me to record, I need you to, um, yeah. And mine is auto recording, but I'm going to still make you the host. And that way we have two of us doing it just in case. Okay. I should have done that. Did it do that for you? Um, yes. Thank you. Okay. And I'm not sure if it's going to require you to let people in because it has a waiting room instead of a passcode. Got it. But just in case so far. Shut up. Shut up. <laughs> Hi, Charlie. <laughs> we're just talking Hi. about. Hi, we we're just talking about dogs and needing, uh, wanting a drink too. And then I know we were going to have one that was going to have to come back later to watch. So I know we'll have one less there for sure. <clears throat> so do we want to wait a few, couple, two minutes and then get started or? What do you think, Brian? Or you, we could get started and then they can join in. We can kind of do, I know Ryan and I had some intro stuff and then if they pop in or do you want to wait a minute? I am at your disposal. So <laughs> whatever you all want to do. Okay. I'm just here to drink some whiskey. All right. That's always a good plan. <laughs> right on. Um, I was just looking through the names. It looks like pretty much everybody that we were waiting on is here. Except for the one that we knew would come later. Yeah. So hello, everybody. My name is Brian, um, and I am the RA portion of RA plus A, our design collaborative. So Amanda and I put the boxes together for you guys. Um, Brian's going to give the educational piece, but we just wanted to thank you for 
purchasing the box and joining us tonight. And then I'm gonna pass it over to Amanda. She's got a little bit more information she wants to share with you. Yeah, thank you everybody for being here. We're super excited. Um, you know, virtual events are something that Ryan and I have been dipping into and we're really excited to be partnering with Brian and Old Forester for this event. So um, we are happy to be able to create and curate the box that came with the educational portion that Brian's gonna go over today. Um, on the card, you'll see that we have a couple other boxes coming up too. So we have a taste of summer. We're currently in our layers of love box, um, which is kind of hits right around Mother's Day. Um, for deliveries. We have a taste of summer that'll happen in June. And then we also will have a few others. We're going to be partnering with Brian on another one. So you'll see that information coming out um, soon as well. And the, and the other, um, the box with Brian will also have the, the educational portion too. So we're really excited. And we're, we're excited to uh, have, have y'all here tonight. So I'm excited to drink some whiskey. So let's do it. Well, easy enough then. So uh, I don't think I've met anybody except Brian and Amanda once. So I'll just quickly introduce myself. My name is Brian. I work for Brown Foreman currently. I have spent the last 10 years in the liquor industry, most of that time as a whiskey or scotch ambassador. Uh, I've spent a time in beer and wine and basically if it can it get you tipsy, I've, I've sold it or represented it in some form or fashion. But what we're going to be going over tonight or what we're going to be tasting tonight is Old Forester. And Old Forester is kind of a unique and special brand because it really offers a true taste of American whiskey through the history of American whiskey. So going back to, to 1870, which you'll note, which is the first bottle that we're going to be drinking, Old Forester 1870, the original batch, if you will, it was uh, very common for uh, whiskey to be only distributed in barrels. In fact, we are the first American whiskey to be bought, put into glass bottles. So in 1870, a gentleman by the name of George Garvin Brown, uh, who was not a distiller, by the way, he was a pharmaceutical sales rep, uh, decided that he wanted to offer his pharmacies a better option. Rather than pulling their prescriptions out of a barrel that they kept in the pharmacy, he wanted to make sure that he was giving them a clear, clean, consistent product. Because what would often happen in these pharmacies is, you know, someone would pour a little extra, take a little bit home, give a customer a little bit more than they needed or was prescribed. And to make up for that, they would fill it with water or iodine or tobacco spit or, you know, just kind of whatever they had laying around that made it look like whiskey again. And obviously that's not what you want to be giving to customers. And George Garvin Brown was very serious about the two, two things, uh, consistency and quality. Those were his two watchwords. And honestly, they're the two watchwords we have today. If you are to ever get an opportunity to go to Louisville and go to the old Forester Distillery, you'll see on one of the back walls in the rooms, they have a bunch of sample bottles. They're about 200 milliliters and they're lining the back walls in, in one of the, the conference rooms. And they're bottles of Old Forester 86 that date back to 1971. And those whiskey bottles uh, are consistent. They, the idea is that if you go back and taste a, a whiskey sample from 1971 all the way through to 2021, that you won't be able to taste a difference, a discernible difference to the, even the most refined palate uh, in the whiskey. So consistency and quality, two watchwords that we live by and die by as old Forester as a company. It's why we don't sell our product to somebody else like MGP, Buffalo Trace, or others do. Out of all of the bourbons in America, there's really only about seven distilleries. Almost everybody else sources their whiskey. So we do not. We, we create and batch only our own whiskey and we do not get it from anybody else. We do all of our maturation and all of our maturing and all of our stage statementing and all of that fun stuff right in our own distilleries and, and rickhouse in Louisville, Kentucky. So kind of a, kind of a little history there. And then the, the, the reason we picked that we have these four bottles that we have, we call it our taste through history, is because what they offer is the taste, the times when George Garvin Brown or the, or the Brown Forester Company, Brown Foreman Company, had to break their promise of quality or consistency in one way or another. So we're going to start with the original promise, the original batch. And that's the one that should have a 70 or a, a 1970. I, I wasn't exactly sure how, Rob, how uh, Ryan marked them, but it's, it's the one that's got the 70. And uh, so I'm going to give you just a few quick tasting notes. How to, uh, if, if you're not a, a whiskey taster, you don't generally do whiskey tastings. These are my simple notes for, for tasting whiskey. You don't put your nose all the way in the glass like this. You're going to keep your, your glass about a finger's length below your nose. When I'm drinking a big red wine, all my nose is all the way in there and I'm pulling all those flavors up and I wanna get all of it. The difference between a red wine and a whiskey is of course proof. So a 15% whiskey is gonna be, hit your brain and your nose and, your, and your, your organs a whole lot differently 
than a 40% whiskey, right? So we want to make sure that we're not knocking ourselves unconscious with a big heavy drink of that aroma right into our nose. Uh, so right, right, right about one inch below, just, you know, my mustache. When the other thing when you're tasting, when you're nosing your whiskey is you want to keep your mouth open. You want to let those aromas go through your palate, hit the back of your tongue and come right back out your mouth. So when you're, when you're smelling, it's just right in and out. And then the other thing that people always seem to be a little bit surprised by is that uh, your nose works like your ears. It works in stereo. The right side and left side are connected to different parts and they'll pick up different things because they're, because of the way your nose works. So going from side to side and, and trying to get different things from, from your whiskey glass, you'll pick up different notes and different, different tenors uh, from, from whiskey to whiskey. So just a couple of, of fun, quick notes. Does anybody have anything on the nosing of the whiskey? Nope. So on tasting your whiskey, the next thing I'm going to tell you is that first sip, um, it's important to remember that, that alcohol is poison. I mean, not a hurtful poison, but it's poison just the same. And your mouth and your brain are going to react to it as such. Forgive my phone. I'm sorry. I thought I had that quieted. Um, your mouth, is, your brain is going to react to whiskey as a poison. It's, it's going to be hot. It's going to be unpleasant. The first sip of any drink on a, of a given day, your, your body is really going to react to it in a way that tells your tells your your mouth to please spit that out. I don't want that. It's poison. It takes a second for your brain to, to, to connect and go, oh yeah, never mind. It's good. We like this stuff. This is the good stuff, right? Okay, cool. So that first sip, hold it in your mouth for a couple of seconds. You know, give your mouth a good two or three seconds to really process what's in your mouth so that your second sip is actually more enjoyable. But the first one, hold it in your mouth for two or three seconds, let it roll around and do it. So right on the nose, we'll just put this right up and right off the, the, right off the bat, you can kind of smell all of the things that are going to make an American whiskey truly identifiable against all other whiskeys. You got oak, you got vanilla, you got a little shortbread, you got some caramel. These are all things that are truly uniquely identifiable to American bourbon uh, specifically because we use new first time used uh, American oak barrels. And it's that's by law, by the way. Um, you have these really unique characteristics that only come from from first for first fill or virgin casking. So you'll find those on almost every whiskey. The predominant notes are going to be vanilla, caramel, oak, honey. This one is unique because it's got a little bit of shortbread. And then everybody always says, oh, I can smell the banana. It smells like a, a nice banana bread. And it really does. And that's what that that comes from our yeast strain. Our yeast strain is very um, is, is a very banana heavy yeast strain. So it really does kind of lend to that uh, to that banana bread flavor right in there. So that's your nose. And then let's go ahead and put that first sip on our lips and, and, and hold it in our mouth for a second. Oopsies, we went, we, we skipped ahead. So did we, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> like, Me too. we were talking a lot and it was too appealing. <laughs> I get it, I get it. But what's nice about so what's nice about this dram is it's a 90 proofer, right? It's a great entry point into bourbon. It's not going to overpower you, even on that first sip, like I mentioned. And the things that you're going to get right off the bat, you're going to see like um, hints of clove, just a little bit of that herbaceousness that comes from, again, that American oak and in our distilling process. We have a, our mash bill, which is our, comp our, our composition of um, grains, is 72, 18, 10. So 72% corn. 18% uh, rye, 10% barley. So 72, 18, 10. Um, that's the composition of our, of our whiskey. Uh, to be an American bourbon, you must be 51%. So that's where all the sweetness is going to come from in this whiskey, is that high corn volume. Because it's got such a high corn volume, corn lends to sweetness. If you uh, think of a Tito's vodka, for example, which is 100% corn vodka, got a very big sweetness to it. It doesn't, hey, it's just still got that alcohol, but it, it's, it's vodka, but it's got a sweetness to it. And that comes again from the corn. So in any distillate where you see that corn is going to be the predominant feature, you're going to find sweetness. So let's go back to our second sip. Alrighty. Does Old Forester make a, just a straight rye? It does. Well, not a straight rye. We have a rye mash bill that's a 65% rye. Okay. Um, it's a little bit sweeter because it's a uh, 30% or 32% corn. So we add a little bit of sweetness back into our rye. Um, that agrees more. I'm really sorry about the giant Great Dane upstairs, if you can hear that. Um, 
it, 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 um, the rye tends to be very peppery. It's not to my palate. Um, I know that a lot of people have really gravitated towards that rye pepperness. Um, that doesn't necessarily hit my palate right. Uh, I don't, I don't like that cracked black pepper on my palate. So, but again, everybody's palate's unique and different and wonderful. And, and I wouldn't tell anybody not to drink something that they like. But for me, that's just a little bit too hot. I, it's not something I enjoy. So I actually do like our rye, but again, predominantly that's because we we complement that sweetness. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, no worries. So again, uh, the just the sweetness of this one, you know, you got that nutmeg and you've got shortbread, you've got all those those kind of kind of signature flavors, and that's really what the base the base of Old Forester is. You're going to find all of those all the way through these, these taste profiles with the exception of 1910. And we'll explain that in a minute, but all of those kind of base flavors are right there and really strong. And it really is a perfect um, identifier. If you were to ever get the opportunity to meet Jackie's I can, she's our um, master taster, master blender now as well. She would tell you that 90 proof is exactly where old forester lives. And to that point, one of the reasons that, um, that the 100 or that the 90 proof was the original batch is because that old for this is this is what George Garvin Brown uh, and Dr. William Forrester set thought represented the whiskey the best it was a 90 proof bourbon with this combination of mash bill 72 18 10 like I talked about and this is how it represented itself the best for the longest time you could only buy old Forrester special selections at 90 proof because even in a single barrel format 90 proof was thought to be the best representation of this brand. Um, you can agree with that. You can disagree with that. Again, everybody's palate's different and unique and all of those things are true, but for the, the, the core of the brand that like we talked about before, that consistency and quality, that's where it lives. Oh, quick question, Brian. Is Please. This the, um, is this the bourbon that you would say sells the most out of, out of the four that we're tasting today? No, it's not actually. Um, you would think that it might be, but it's not. The, the number one is the, the number one selling bourbon of the four of these is actually the last two. It bounces back and forth month to month between 1910 and 1920. Okay. Uh, there's a reason for that. And we'll talk about why those two are the most popular okay. as we kind of get through through the tasting. So uh, let's go ahead and grab our uh, 1897 or the one that says 97 on the top. Go ahead and knock out the last little bit of that 70 if you got it. And you can pour these right on top of each other or not. Um, it's entirely up to you. Um, one of the things that I, I love about the 1897 is the story. Wow, my camera is just having a, a fit. I'm really sorry, guys. Uh, one of the things about the 1897 that's really cool is the story behind it. 1897 is referred to as the bottled and bond. Now, bottled and bond is... Uh, uh, an interesting time in American culture. In 1897, the first Consumer Protection Act in the United States was passed. It's, the, it's, it's called the Bottled and Bond Act. This is nine years before there's the, the FDA is created. They weren't carried about care. They didn't care about your meat or your vegetables or your credit or your home or your car or your horse or any of that stuff. They were concerned about regulating your whiskey. Uh, part of that was, was due to a gentleman by the name of Colonel E.H. Taylor. And his whiskey is still around to this day or a version of it at any rate. And uh, he decided that he really wanted to stipulate some ground rules for whiskey. And they created a, a set of guidelines, a, a set of laws, if you will, that stipulated exactly what American whiskey had to be. So it had to be at 100 proof. Well, if you remember, we, our original batch was 90. So this is the first promise we have to break if we're going to follow this, if we're going to qualify for this government seal of approval. You had to grow, harvest, and distill all of your product in one season. And those seasons were from, uh, from January to June and July to December. So you couldn't, if you harvested your grain in April, but couldn't get it distilled until October, it wasn't going to qualify for a bottled and bond seal. You had to pay for a tax assessor to live on site. The reason that pay, you had to pay for a tax assessor was because he was the only person that could have access to your resting bourbon which by law now had to be rested for a minimum of four years. Um, most people were doing it for much longer than that already, but the, there was now a law that said minimum of four years. Now most are gonna go to six. Uh, in fact, ours is generally a six year old. We don't put age statements on our whiskeys except for our birthday bourbon, but uh, that's the general rule of thumb. The six years is gonna be your bottled and bought. And that tax assessor was the only person who had keys to your rickhouse, which was the storage facility for all of your barrels. 
So you, you could not go in and access your whiskey to turn it, check it or anything without getting the tax assessor out of his house to come over and unlock the door for you. So you could go in and start tasting and sampling your whiskey. So kind of a bogus deal there for, from the government, but only Brown, who was George's oldest son said, dad, you know, I know we're passionate about 90 proof, but there's a tide coming in America and we need to be on the government side. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to change. This was the first time that, that George Garvin Brown broke one of his promises of quality or consistency. And in this tie case, it was only consistency. We went from 90 proof to 100 proof to meet the bottled and bond standard. And anytime that you're looking at shelves of, of whiskey now, if you see bottled and bond, it's 100 proof. Anybody who, even today, anybody who puts bottled and bond on their label is going to be 100 proof bottled and bond whiskey. So this one is a, a little bit different. Um, and again, on the nose, the things are going to be pretty much the same. You're going to get that kind of caramel. You're going to get that, that honey. You're going to get, um, oh, excuse me. You're going to get those, those kind of vanilla E notes. That's not going to change a whole lot, but what you will find underneath that, that nose is a lot of the fig and dark berries. And that's a, that's a really a scotch trait. So it's kind of weird to see it come out in something that's got this high of a corn bill because scotch is all barley, right? So scotch is only three ingredients water, barley, and yeast. That's it. Everything else that happens is by wood. And so to find those kind of weird uh, barley notes come through in this, this maturation is really kind of cool. Uh, the other thing that you're going to get for, for my rye fans in, in the room, Mr. Miller, are uh, you're going to get a lot of cracked black, black, cracked black pepper on the mouth of this one. There's a lot of big heat, a big, big pepper on this one. And in this case, I like it because it's complemented by that sweet corn. So let's go ahead and give this one a taste. Yeah, I would agree with that. And for uh, it being a little stronger than the 90, I thought it was almost a little smoother even. Well, and I, I always say that this doesn't drink like 100 proof, right? So uh, you're going to find the same of the same as the 1920. I, the 1920 is 115 proof, but it doesn't drink like it to me. But this one's got that cracked black pepper, a little bit of brown sugar on the finish to sweeten it out to make it a little bit more palatable. But that's coming from, again, that sweet corn mash bill and the virgin oak wood. And that's, that's what's bringing this all together and making it, even though it's a hundred proof, it's not super bitey. I mean, like I said, you got that cracked black pepper. I mean, it's, it's activating the sides of my tongue and making it very sweet or making it very hot. I mean, those, those uh, chili pepper sensors on the side of my mouth, but it's not overpowering. It's not, um, it's, it's not obnoxious, I guess is the best way to put it for me. So again, I'll take another, take another dram of this one and let it settle in. We can circle back to the bottle of Embank quick. Um, that be the same Colonel E. H. Taylor from Buffalo Trace Master Distiller. Yeah. Was it more yeah, him? E. Trying... Go Sorry, ahead. Go ahead. Uh, no, go was ahead. it more him trying to muscle his way or push people around and take control of the market, or was it more of a government action? Or no, what... it was. There was a, a group of lobbyists petitioning Washington at the time. He was just the most vocal of the Kentucky distillers. Uh, and, you know, we, we talk about, you know, there being only, you know, six or seven true distillers in the United States and 90% of all bourbon, whether it's from those big distillers or from the little bitty ones around, uh, all actually co generally come from Kentucky because of their, uh, that big limestone plate that Kentucky sits on. It's a nice cold water. water. It produces beautiful filtered uh, iron free water. Iron free is the key. If you were to put, if you were to get iron in your water, what you're going to end up with is a super cloudy liquor. You're not going to get a clear, crisp, clean, amber finish like that. And you can't, yeah, you can see pretty well through it. Uh, you, this gives you a nice, clean, crisp, amber, amber liquid. If you were to have any iron in it, it would look cloudy. It would look like uh, you dropped some powder into it and it would just not look right. And that's what, that's what uh, iron does to, to your distillate. So the reasoning for it is anytime you go, anytime you distill outside of someplace like Kentucky that has beautiful, crisp, basically pre-filtered groundwater, there's a huge filtration process involved in getting that iron out of the water. And it's, it can become cost, cost extensive to keep that filtration process moving and going and, and keeping up with your distillation. So uh, that's actually one of the, the principal reasons. So the other cool thing, but, but to answer, to go back to your original question, Ryan, sorry, uh, the, the, the Kentucky distillers wanted a standard by which they could set. 
And even though George Garvin Brown and Dr. Forrester had created a benchmark, there was no regulation behind it. And what they really wanted, what some, what the, what the elite quote unquote distillers in Kentucky at the time wanted was a clarification of what is actually American whiskey. It would be until 1964 when the Whiskey Preservation of America Act was passed that a true definition of bourbon would be created. And those laws that we talk about now, you know, 51% corn, virgin oak, no distillation over uh, 140, no barreling over 125, uh, no bottling over 127 or 130, you know, all of those rules that we have to follow in, in the bourbon community to be called a bourbon, to be called a straight Kentucky bourbon, uh, those truly didn't exist until 1964. Again, most reputable distilleries were following it, but Colonel Taylor really wanted a government act that basically said, if you don't do this, you're not going to sell your product. He was trying to weed out the riffraff, for lack yep. of a better term. And then you said that bottled and bond aged six years? Six years, yes, sir. What's your normal aging? Like, what's to be a Kentucky straight bourbon, you must be aged for four years. That's uh, that's that's the minimum minimum age requirement to be a Kentucky straight bourbon. So you can be a Kentucky bourbon on two years, uh, but to be a Kentucky straight bourbon, you must be four years on four years on wood uh, for uh, four years on virgin American oak wood. Uh, at Brown Foreman, we're very fortunate in the wood department. We own two of our own cooperages. One is in Louisville, Kentucky, and one is in a small town outside of Atlanta, Georgia. And forgive me, I can't remember the name of it all of a sudden off the top of my head. Um, but we own our own cooperages and we for we deforest from our own property. So uh, we have a team of science and conservationists who go in, check the canopy, uh, make sure anything that we're taking down does not uh, diminish the canopy or the wildlife beneath it. And we harvest our own trees, create our own wood and, and, and create our own barrels. So we control our entire process from grain to wood. And it uh, gives us a little bit of an edge in terms of consistency and quality. We're not relying on somebody else's idea of what the wood should be or where the wood came from wood growing in different parts of the of the world will have different traits to it right i mean if you're if you're uh if you if you're a milk drinker you'll know that the the cloves of western michigan dra- dra- differ greatly from the grass of of northern ohio and that you can actually taste the difference in your milk well the same is going to be true of whiskey uh if you're getting your wood from northern Michigan, you know, you're going to have an entirely different climate of growth and and soil and fertilizer than if you're growing, getting your trees from the hillsides of West Virginia, for example. So uh, consistency, again, going back to that promise, consistency and quality, we're able to maintain that consistency because we can take control everything from grain to wood. So Brian, would you say that the fact that you guys control um, the process makes Old Forester unique in itself? It does. Uh, it makes it unique. We have there are a few things that make Old Forester unique. Um, if 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 anybody in here is a real bourbon hunter, you'll know that there's big chases over allocated bottles, uh, and our whiskey roast series could quite functionally be in a heavily allocated bottle. They're they're incredibly high quality whiskey. They range in that that high allocation price between fifty and sixty dollars. Um, they're brands that people they're they're ones that people love and, and seek seek after and. If we wanted to, we could limit our production run and be a super high allocated brand with these whiskey row bottles. Um, but again, kind of going back to that quality and consistency promise, one of the other things that George Garvin Brown was super passionate about was that everybody be able to access his product. So with the exception of a few bottles were of celebration, like the birthday bourbon that's released every September in honor of Mr. Brown, uh, all of our bottles, we try to make sure that we don't release it until we can make sure that everybody can drink it. So you're not, you shouldn't be, have to go into a place and be, oh, they're out of stock on this one. You know, we're only getting, we're only getting 15 barrels in the, or 15 cases in the state next month. And gee, Williker, sorry about your luck. I'm sorry you enjoy that. You can't have it right now. So um, you can think Blanton's for something like that, or think, uh, oh, there's a few of them, I guess, but Blanton's is probably the most popular one right now that, that everybody likes, but nobody can get, and it becomes a hunted bottle our bottles are always available. So that makes us unique in in that aspect as well. So let's go ahead and pour the 1910 and we'll let that open for a second while I talk about it. What's really cool about 1910 is it's a total accident. This is the first time in Old Forester's legacy where we have a break, not just of uh, consistency, but actually this was a break of quality. 
that was also a break in consistency. So in 1910, uh, well, in 1908, we had moved our distribution facility to, um, excuse me, to a, to a town in, uh, or to a street called Mattingly, just outside of uh, downtown Louisville. And uh, there was a fire in the distillery. And that fire, you can imagine a bottling line and a big tub of whiskey hanging above it. And boy, when that, when, when that fire hits that whiskey, there's going to be a real problem, right? So the, they quickly grabbed that whiskey, shoved it into barrels. Fortunately, we're meticulous records keepers. And uh, we know exactly how that barrel was, those barrels were created. And nine months later, they go back to pull that whiskey out and they put it into glasses and everybody's like, whoa, 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 whoa. This is really good, but it ain't old forester. So what are they going to do? George Garvin Brown and only Brown being Scotsman are notoriously cheap and aren't going to throw away an entire batch of whiskey. So they batched it up and called it Old Fine Whiskey by Old Forester. So the name was still on there, but it was Old Fine Whiskey was the predominant feature, making sure that they didn't have any problems with uh, people identifying it as the original batch of 90 proof. They proofed it out at 93. And what you have here is America's first double oak. Now double oak will, will does and still goes on today to become one of the most popular methods of maturation by finishing off in a secondary barrel of a different char and to toast and char. Uh, but this was the very first one. The very first double oaking happened by complete accident in 1910 with this one. Now, if you're familiar with double oaking, you'll know that it's going to be much, much sweeter right off the bat. I mean, just big brown sugar right in the nose. You're going to have a lot more of that caramel and butterscotch and those kind of big, uh, big apricot notes. It's just it's just a completely and totally different nose on it than the other two. The core is still there, right? Vanilla, caramel, those are still there. But you're getting so many other different unique flavors out of, out of the nose on this one. And then on the mouth. so much sweeter and so much creamier. This is the one that I like to talk about the legs of a whiskey on. If you've got a glass and you just give it a quick swirl, you can watch the, watch the line of your whiskey go up to the top and then start kind of dripping back down. It's called the legs of your whiskey. And the more oily and creamy and full a whiskey is, the longer the legs are going to be. So when, when you say a whiskey's got nice long legs, what you're saying is, it takes a long time for that whiskey to drain back down into the glass and slide back down. And this one's got that big kind of buttercream mouth. It's really oily and really full. And it's just really got a round mouth finish to it, but also coupled with that big sweetness of caramel and butterscotch and, and vanilla. It's just, this is, this one is generally everybody's favorite. And for my new whiskey drinkers, this is usually the first glass I pull. Someone who says, oh, I don't like whiskey or I, I'm not a whiskey fan. Like, oh, well, I've got something you should try. And, and if you're still not a whiskey fan, you're probably not a whiskey fan after this one. But this one or Woodford Reserve Double Oak is another one that's big and chocolate and, and, and book caramel and, and, and woodsy, really, really big, big flavors on it. So this is a really, really great one. How's the aging rules work for double oak? Double oaking is really a finishing process. Um, and it's then it comes really to distiller's taste. There is no requirement for it. Generally speaking, you're going to find the double oaks. The second oaking is going to be between six and 10 months. Uh, anything more than that. And you're putting uh, wooded whiskey back on virgin wood again. And you're going to start getting a lot of oakiness to it. You want a little bit of oak uh, with any whiskey, but this, it becomes very oaky the longer you let it filter through that, that uh, charcoal and into the wood and then back out again. You don't want to have too much wood on it. You don't want to have too much oakiness. So there is a fine balancing point. And I think most distillers have found that it's generally between six and 10 months. I can tell you that the old forester is nine. Uh, we do about a nine month finish, you know, plus or minus 15 days. We're about nine months on our double oaking. And the same thing is going to be true over at Woodford. Chris Matthews has found about nine months this is about perfect for the Woodford Reserve double so oak. Is, is that like four years in the, call it first oaking and then... Yep. 10 months in the second or finishing. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And it's, it's probably closer to five or six years. Uh, generally speaking, we age everything between five and seven years, uh, okay. just depending on where it's at in the warehouse and what hot zones we're getting and all of that yep. stuff. So our whiskey is generally five to seven years. Anyway, we don't, we don't adhere to that four year rule very often. 
Sorry, we have a very large dog here too. Oh, <laughs> oh, the baby. Thank you. Yeah, uh, my yeah, my great Dane's just she's being a jerk today. Anytime someone comes to the window, it's bork 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 bork. Um, so that's nineteen ten, and this is uh, this is probably one of the most popular of the old Forester line, and again, it's because of that sweetness. And then I'm going to try to rush through this a little bit just in case Zoom does kick us off because I can see we've got a. Oh, never mind. We've been included into uh, unlimited minutes. Way to go, Amanda. I can slow down. Woo! Woo, woo to Amanda. Um, yeah, we can do that. This is easier. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> so, but, but, double, but that double oaking and that woodiness and that oakiness, that's something that really appeals to the American palate. Uh, generally speaking, uh, I, I sold wine for a lot of years. And one of the rules that I found with wine was I'm a big fan of a big fat dry cap. You know, I, if, if my, if I, if my mouth isn't puckering after a couple of sips, it just wasn't dry enough. And, but that's a very European quality. Uh, most American, most of the American palate is generally geared towards sweet. So when you're, when you've got something like a Camus Napa cab, which people think of as a big high volume or not high volume, a big high value um cabernet from napa it's got a lot of sweetness to it when you compare it with a chapelet or uh, a burgundy from france so there's the sweetness of the american palate is general or the, the american palate is generally geared towards sweetness and that's why i think 1910 double oaks uh pick your pick your sweet mark uh in the whiskey world really always going to be a, a high value seller so i hope that answered the question around sweetness in 1920, uh, only Brown's uh, prediction comes to fruition, and the uh, the America goes into a dry spell, and prohibition is passed. And at the time, there was uh, ten distilling licenses offered because even as far even as recently as 1920, actually as more recently as 1930 and 40. Uh, whiskey was still being written as a prescription by doctors on a pretty regular basis. And to maintain that prescription base, the U.S. government, through prohibition, offered up 10 distillation licenses. Only six of those were ever claimed or were ever authorized. And one of those was Old Forester. And Oldie Brown's relationship and his friendliness with the U.S. government through the Bottled and Bond Act and into prohibition were reasons that we were allowed to continue distilling. It was important at the time because we were a family owned distillery. We wouldn't go public and trade on the New York Stock Exchange for about another 40 years. And the US and the, and the Bourbon Act wouldn't pass for another, um, for another uh, 40, 44 years. So the, the idea that, that we could survive as a, as a family owned business, a family owned distillery hinged on us being able to sell during prohibition. So there was some rules to prohibition distillation, just like rules to um, uh, the Bottle and Bond Act. One of those was that it had to be at 115 proof. If it's medicine, it's gotta be strong medicine. You couldn't put it in, um, you couldn't put it in bottles bigger than 375s, what we call pints today. Uh, basically half of a 750 that you would buy on the shelf, half of a fifth. Uh, you couldn't take it out or you couldn't um, sell it in more than two prescriptions at a time. Uh, you couldn't carry more than a certain amount in your pharmacy. Uh, you had to have the prescription for it. There was all these little regulations and, loophole, and, and loopholes we had to jump through to get this distillation license. And it's why so many were refused and why... Um, only six were ever claimed through the period of prohibition from 1920 to 1933. Uh, this is probably, for today's bourbon drinker, this is probably the number one selling, generally speaking, um, uh, a line of uh, whiskey in the old Forester whiskey row lineup. It doesn't outsell our 86 proof or our, our mixing bourbon, the 100 or the 86, but it, it, it is probably the, the biggest selling of the, uh, whiskey row series and, and it's really easy to see why we talked earlier about how the bottled and bond is 100 proof but man it just doesn't drink like it. it drinks smooth and clean and i think the same thing's true on this one it doesn't drink like 115 proof it just doesn't have that fire uh even though it really packs a wallop don't drink two or three of them and then try to stand up off your bar stool you end up falling right back down so 
again, on the nose, this is going to have some really kind of unique characteristics. And again, a lot of that's proofing. A lot of it is now you're smelling more of the distillate and less of the wood. So you're going to get things like, you know, cocoa. You're going to get things like uh, more graham cracker. You're going to get a little bit of cedar. Um, it's just, it's got more of the, the sweetness is there, but it's, 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 it's in the distillate. It's not in the wood. It's not in the maturation process. So we'll take a, take a little nip here. So Brian, does this one have um, some pepper notes in it as well? I think this one, excuse me. I think this one has this big green peppercorn mouthfeel to it that I just, th this I actually like. It's not sharp black pepper. It's right on the tip of your tongue. It's like a, a peppercorn or um, just kind of a nice, clean, rolling, peppery hotness. It kind of starts at the front of your tongue and works its way all the way back down your throat. It's got a really cleanness, clean crispness to it. Um, we talk, you know, again, you get that good sip and you got kind of like a tart green apple, like a Granny Smith on the finish. It's just got this really clean crispness to it all the way through. But it starts to me with that big green peppercorn mouthfeel that's that's right, that's really super present. But again, even the alcohol, even the finish, you know, they 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 call that uh, that burn in your chest on the on the swallow. They call that the Kentucky hug. Even your Kentucky hug is not real not real tight with this particular whiskey. It's just it's really just flows and it's really clean and crisp and I really like it. It gives you a nice quick bite of that of that pepper but it rolls away real fast. It doesn't sit on you like a white pepper or like a cracked black pepper. It just, it comes and it rolls through. And it, I really like this one. I, so when we talk about, I, I don't like pepper, I don't, but this one, because of the way it comes and goes and finishes nice and clean, I actually do really enjoy it. But again, even on the second sip, right? There's just not a lot of that, that alcohol heat. You never at any point feel like you're just, getting an odor of rubbing alcohol or, or pure alcohol distillate, you know, white lightning or moonshine. It's just not there. So again, this is probably the number one selling. And I think that most of my really, my, my friends who are real whiskey aficionados will say that this is their favorite. Um, but I think we've really kind of become kind of a proof society too. You know, what's the biggest proof? What's the highest proof? If we're not allowed to put it in a barrel over 125, then this is about as close to barrel strength as we get in mass production. So that, that lends itself again to a lot of our, our, my, my bourbon friends who are big, big proof hounds coming to it with this. So that's, uh, that's kind of the why and the what for there. If you've got a little bit left in your glass and maybe you have a little bit of water, um, I would encourage you to take just a, just a drop off your finger and just let it drop into the glass there. And what happens when you do that is that whiskey and water are hydrophobic. Or whiskey is hydrophobic. It doesn't like water. It's uh, like oil. Um, it really gives you, uh, it's really going to change the nose and the mouthfeel. Even with just that one little drop of water, it's going to change the way your mouth and your nose perceives it. And it's going to give you, open up those kind of orchard fruits that we talked about. I talked about getting some green apple on the finish of my mouth. Well, now in the nose, it really opens up the green apple. And I can actually get it on the nose too, where I didn't think it was there before. And it's going to open up some of those orchard other fruits too. I mean, you can you can get a little bit more citrus now, and a little bit more of that uh, nut, the little nutmeg and, and cashew in there too. So, and then on the mouth, even just that one drop of water in you know a half an ounce or an ounce of whiskey, really opens it up, and it just chases the entire tongue, and the whole palate kind of explodes, and you get a whole new flavor profile out of it, and it's it's different. Now, I know a lot of you are thinking, Brian, why didn't you tell me about this fun little trick at the very beginning? And the, I'll, I'll give you my reason. Uh, when I represent a whiskey, whatever whiskey it is, um, I always represent it the way the distiller wanted it represented. That's the way they put it in the bottle. I don't put ice on it. I don't put water in it. I don't proof it down or tell you how to proof it down. I represent it in the way that the distiller, whose job it is to create the best version of their product is. I wouldn't go into a restaurant in order to ask the chef what his best meal is and say, oh, that's cool, but I don't want onions or mayonnaise or peppers or tomatoes. You know, it just, you know, just make me a hamburger with cheese and I'm good. You know, I, I wouldn't do that to a chef. So I don't do that to a distiller either. Now, I will tell you that there are so many different and awesome ways to enjoy your whiskey. No matter what whiskey you're drinking, whether you put an E in there or not, 
Irish, Asian. Uh, there's some awesome whiskeys coming out of the Netherlands and, and that, that region, region up there. Um, Scotch, uh, American, Canadian. All, there's no wrong way to enjoy a whiskey except the way you don't like it. But the things that you can do to change the whiskey or to experience that whiskey in a different way, number one, huge ice ball. Huge ice ball adds water slowly, chills it down, numbs the palate a little bit so that you kind of learn the whiskey as you're coming through and offers a different flavor profile. The other thing you can do is what I always do, which is just a, just a drop of water on my third or fourth or fifth sip, just a little drop of water in there. And it really opens up the palate and changes the profile and changes the dynamic of that whiskey all the way through. And just kind of gives you a different sense of what's there and what's not. So those are a couple of things that you can do to change the whiskey. Um, any questions? Any anything I can answer for you guys about that? Which one's your favorite? My favorite? Yeah. Honestly, it varies from day to day. I really like the bottled and bond. Boo! Um, give us a real answer. <laughs> but the one that I find myself pouring the most is probably the 1910. The 1910 is probably my 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 biggest go to. Um, because it's clean, because it's crisp, because it's a lighter proof, I can have a couple of them. Uh, I enjoy the flavor profile of that, that big caramely sweetness. Um, when I'm, when I, when I go to scotch, I go to, I generally tend to lean towards the Highlands and specifically a lot of sherry bombs, you know, like Vendronic or, uh, Aberlauer, or, uh, there's a couple of Macallans that have a nice cherry, cherry roundness to them. So I tend to go to those sherry bombs. Um, so for me, it's, it's, it's probably that 1910 because it's got a little bit of that kind of reminiscence of, uh, those, those Scottish whiskeys that I enjoy so much. So Brian, I know we did this today because it's Thurby. So I wanted you to maybe share that with everyone about what that means and why we chose today is the, Oh yeah, for sure. So uh, I, I <laughs> that's funny you said that. I kind of blanked on that. So uh, we chose today because today is Thurby. The Kentucky Derby is uh, America's oldest and, long, and, and longest running sports tradition. It's 147 years old this year with only one interruption in 1942. And every year uh, from Wednesday through to, to the, the race of the Kentucky Derby at seven o'clock on Saturday, is a huge festival of horse racing at Churchill Downs. Um, you have the Philly race, you have the female jockey race, you have the Kentucky Derby. But on Thursday specifically, it's the, it's the, the fan access day uh, for Churchill Downs. So anybody who's a fan of racing, who's a patron of, of Churchill Downs, you can get in. It's inexpensive. It's fun. It's kind of a party atmosphere. And Old Forester is the official sponsor of that, of that day. It's the, it's the Thurby event, T-H-U-R-B-Y, presented by Old Forester. And it's really just kind of the, the working man's opportunity to go to Churchill Downs and spend some time at, the, at, at a huge race weekend. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's really an absolute blast. If you ever have a chance to go, uh, the entire Derby weekend is a hoot, but, but Thurby is, the, is, is a real party. The Millionaire's Row, the, the press box is right along the start finish line. The, the owner's box is right along the start finish line uh, is an absolute blast. Old Forester opens up their box, and so do a lot of the, the, the others on Millionaire's Row. And they, uh, they just let anybody come in and have a good time watching the races from the best seats in the house, and it's an absolute blast. So next year, Old uh, Forester is going to sponsor the Derby, right? What's that? Next year, Old Forester is going to sponsor the Derby, right? Nope, Woodford, Woodford. Woodford Reserve. Woodford Reserve is the presenting sponsor of the Kentucky Derby. The always. official drink. What's that? They always have to be. Uh, it's it's just our agreement. It's ah. uh, Woodford. We we uh, <laughs> last year. Uh, everybody may remember that that there was the beginnings of a pandemic right around the first week of May, and our lives went a little bit cattywampus, and uh, they they started postponing things. And one of the first things to 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 kick was the the Kentucky Derby and they decided they were going to postpone it and run it and run it as the third leg of the triple crown instead of the first leg of the triple crown. Yep. Which yeah. was interesting having the shortest race as the last race, but it was weird. Uh, it is what it is. But um, so during that, that period of time, there was no live sports happening. Hockey was shut down. Basketball was shut down. 
baseball was being a bunch of dodo birds and not figuring out how to capitalize on all of this. And we had a live football draft, but we didn't have anything else. So Old Forester launched their first uh, Kentucky Turtle Derby. In 1942, the last time we had to postpone or we had to stop the Kentucky Derby, they did what was called the Kentucky Turtle Derby. It was a fun gimmicky race. They put eight horses or eight turtles in the middle of a circle. And the first one to get out of the circle was declared the winner. <laughs> so they we brought that back last year and we're doing it again this year. If you're, if you're interested in having a little fun, the odds were just released on the eight turtles. I've got it my money on Steve. Last year. The one long shot. Uh, Steve is Steve. Steve came in second last year. He, he placed, you know, he, but he was, he was way out in the lead early and then he got distracted by something and sat down and turtled up and it was unbelievable. Seattle sloth came in from behind and just took him out. What are you going to do? So, uh, but it's a fun, goofy thing. It's a live sporting event. It's got a live race call over it. Uh, it's fun. It streams on YouTube. It's you just Google Kentucky turtle derby. Uh, it's fun. It's goofy. It's silly. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but we're going to hang our hat on the Kentucky turtle derby at old Forester. It's just a little bit more our speed, a little bit less, uh, a little bit maybe less pretentious at Old Forester than the Kentucky Derby, so it's a lot of fun. But the official drink of the Kentucky Derby is actually the Old Forester Mint Julep. So the Mint Julep is the official drink, but the official drink of the Kentucky Derby is made with Old Forester, not Woodford Reserve, even though Woodford Reserve and the Woodford Spire are also uh, drinks served at the Kentucky Derby. There's actually only four uh, drinks served at the Kentucky Derby. Uh, two of them are made with Old Forester, and one of them is made with Woodford Reserve, and the other is made with Finlandia Vodka. Which Great of question. these bourbons is in the official drink? Is in the what's that? Which which of these that we tried, or if there's another one, is the actual one that goes in the official drink? It's Old Forester 86 is the official ingredient in the uh, mint julep. Uh, so it's the base Old Forester cocktail, uh, Old Forester uh, liquid. It's not one that I, I served up to you guys tonight. It's an outstanding bottle for mixing a bourbon cocktail. Oh, no, someone really? got one there. I saw it. I saw it come in. There it is. Yay. Uh, Old Forest 86 is the uh, is the kind of mixing bourbon drink. It's a great, it's fine to sip as well, by the way. It's it's a wonderful little little dram, but it's uh it's more of a mixing bourbon. Um, I've experienced there we have an 86 and 100 proof in that lower range. And they're matured just a little bit shorter period of time. Um, they're not necessarily harvested as fast and, and distilled as quickly. Uh, they're a little bit younger. They're, you know, four years old instead of six or seven or eight years old. Uh, it's just a little bit younger whiskey. So uh, that's what we use for, that's what we recommend using for mixing cocktails. Although I will say, if you've never had an old fashioned with the 1920, you're just letting some of the best in life pass you by. Um, but Old Forest 86 is the uh, the ingredient in the um, the mint julep at, 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 at Churchill Downs. Now, where among this compendium would uh, Statesman fall? So Statesman is another one that sort of falls into the Whiskey Row lineup insofar as we broke that promise again of con consistency and quality. But this time it wasn't our own fault. This time Hollywood came to us and said, hey, we're doing a movie franchise and we really want to have uh, a, an American bourbon uh, as the second part of this movie. And if you're familiar with the Kingsman's, Kingsman movies, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, they wanted a bourbon called Statesman for the second of the Kingsman movies when they came to America and found their international espionage brothers. And uh, we said, sure, we'll make it, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll create a, a specialty bottle and we'll release it and it'll be fun and whatever. And we never, and we created this bottle that had nothing to do and no relation to anything from labeling to bottling that had anything to do with anything else we were doing, period, because we thought, oh, this will be a one-off. Uh, it'll be a specialty bottle. We'll release, we'll make a bunch of it. We'll release it for a year. And we'll be done with it. Well, apparently the public decided that wasn't going to be an option. So uh, it was, became super popular and everybody wanted more of it. So we kept making it. And instead of putting it in line with the, with the rest of our labeling, we actually just kept it separate. And it's a 95 proof. Um, I jokingly refer to that as the Miller Light of my bourbons 
because it is just super light and crisp and airy and you don't think those words should line up that's with the, the meanest thing crispy. you've ever said what's that that's like the meanest thing you've ever said well what i mean by it is that i can sit on my porch on a hot summer day and i can drink four or five of them and on the rocks are neat and just enjoy the whiskey and i'm not i'm not lost in the whiskey it's some of my favorite whiskeys are whiskey and again i i you have to remember for me, whiskey is a job. So a lot of times when I'm drinking a whiskey, it's, Oh, what do I smell? What do I taste? What am I getting? What am I not? Ooh, this opened up since the last time I poured this and this doesn't match my notes at all. And wow, a little bit of oxygen on this bottle and it completely changes the dynamic. And I'm kind of always thinking about it when I'm drinking it. And that's just conditioning at this point. It's not anything that I'm like bragging about. It's just the way I drink whiskey now. So when I can, when I find a bottle like the Statesman, that I can just open and pour and pour and pour and pour. And I just sit and I enjoy it and it's fresh and it's crisp and it's clean and it's not offensive and it doesn't require me to think about it. It's, it's honestly, you say it's a mean thing, but honestly, it's a super high compliment because it's just something that I just sit and enjoy. And it's a really good whiskey. Um, I don't generally include it in my tastings unless that's going to be like a five or a six course meal or something like that when we're doing a tasting because it does fall outside of the parameters of kind of the rest of the Whiskey Row series and that the profile is wildly and completely different. Uh, and it's really kind of a testament to the blending and the distilling of that product that it is with the same Mashville, a relative proof, it is just a wildly and different dram than what you have from anything else in the old Forester lineup. It's, 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 really, it's really a fun, good whiskey, uh, but it is completely different. Question on your ricket setup and mm -hmm. bottling of it. Is it, mm -hmm. um, you know, call it four to seven years and then you're taking some from the high and the middle and the low and combining them into the bottle to get that consistency or is it something different? So it's it's both. Uh, it's, it's that, it's exactly what you talked about. So our rick houses are set up. Our rick houses at Old Forester are four stories. Um, and if you can imagine a four-story warehouse, there's going to be a lot of heat variant from top to bottom. Same thing's true at Woodford Reserve or, or Buffalo Trace or any place else, quite frankly. You have a huge brick house like that, and uh, you're going to have a lot of variance in temperature uh, from day to day uh, as, as you go through the seasons. So we do something that's called heat cycling to maintain a level of consistency. And basically, we're, while doing that, we're also creating a false season. So we will drop thermometers through the cork into a couple hundred barrels of the whiskey. And we'll keep an eye on those thermometers as they get to a certain temperature of, it's, I'll just generically say 45 degrees. The whiskey gets chilled down to 45 degrees. We will turn on the heat and blast heat through that building for the next 42 to 72 hours until the whiskey in that barrels gets back up to an ambient temperature of 68 to 70 degrees. What that does is it forces that cold whiskey back out of the wood and creates a, an artificial season of maturation, you know, whiskey going in and out through cold and warm temperatures. And then we turn the heaters off and we let it cool back down naturally. So what that does is it allows us to kind of monitor where our temperature variants are through a four story warehouse but also make sure that as those temperatures, especially in the lower portions of the warehouse are coming down, we can, we can re regulate our temperature through zone heating and, and, and heat cycling. It gives us an opportunity to basically maintain a consistent quality of product year round by creating artificial seasonings and making sure the temperature within the barrels is consistent throughout the rickhouse from top to bottom, left to right. We basically are able to artificially control the whole thing. It's interesting when you think about it, we, we say that um, a year in the United States is the equivalent to about three and a half years of maturation in Scotland because the variance in temperature in Scotland is only about 35 or 40 degrees, whereas the variant temperature in Kentucky can be you know freezing to 115. So you have a huge variance in temperature from say 30 to 100, so a 70 degree variant and that wood is going in and it's getting cold and then it's squeezing it back out and then it's getting really porous and open and it's letting the whiskey back in and then squeezing it back out. 
it takes about seven, it takes about three times, three and a half times as long to get that same response in a, in a scotch whiskey. So your maturation process is a lot longer. So a three-year whiskey in the United States is a nine-year or a 10-year whiskey in, in Scotland. So yep. um, they, they maintain that more naturally. They maintain that temperature variance a lot more naturally by, by, by virtue of their climate but also by virtue of the fact that they use dunnages more often than they use rickhouses. And dunnage is a half underground story building that's only about eight feet tall and the barrels are only ever stacked three high. So um, I think that answered your question, Brian. I might, Ryan, I might've gone off on a tangent there because I sometimes do that, but the, 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 we maintain our temperature through, um, through, through the process of heat cycling and constant monitoring. And then yes, we do pull from all over the warehouse to blend the whiskeys together to maintain that consistency. Um, our, our master blender, Jackie, will say that she has a couple of spots in the warehouse that she knows are sweet spots and she can't wait. She's got, uh, she's got a couple of barrels hidden for her retirement that she's going to yeah. leave in there for 10 or 15 years. And so, so we'll do, you do, do you do zone cooling then too, if it does get 150 in the summer in Kentucky or you just let it ride? We let it ride. We want those pores of that wood open and, and yep. opening and pulling whiskey through it as much as possible. Cold contracts the wood and doesn't allow for that uh, flow of whiskey through the wood. Yep. Um, but but open porous wood allows the whiskey to kind of just naturally germinate through the charcoal and the wood and and move through that on its own on its own course. Uh, tight constricted cold wood does not allow for that same 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 maturation. So that's why we heat cycle to open that wood back up. Yep. And I know the longer that it's in the barrel, um, you know, without the zone heating or whatever, you're going to have some yield loss just from ev natural evaporation throughout it. So if we're yeah, so we, we call bottles, that the angel's chair, uh, yep. the angel's chair is the evaporation process on whiskey. Um, generally referred to as the evaporation process. There's a lot of ways you can lose whiskey. Uh, you can lose whiskey through a leak in a barrel because barrels are not allowed to have any kind of sealant on them. The only ingredient, yep. the only things allowed to touch a wooden barrel are wood and the steel bands. You're not allowed to use wax or nails or yep. any kind of sealant. It's wood and metal bands. So that's how you make your barrels. So um, you can get, you can get a leaker from time to time. That's very common. Um, but that could be, that they would consider that angel share loss as well. But yeah, the evaporation process referred to as the angel share and you lose generally speaking uh, two and a half to three and a half percent of your whiskey annually through the angel share. So yeah, that's, that's, that, that's a real loss. And it's one of the reasons why you'll find something like a Pappy Van Winkle 25 exactly. uh, is such a hugely expensive process. It's not because it's particularly great. Although I think it's a pretty good product. It's because it's super hard to make. You're going to lose, you know, a Pappy Van Winkle 25. You may only have between a quarter and a third of your barrel left by the time you go to, uh, to, to uncork that product and start mixing, blending it up, blending your barrels up. You may only have, you know, when all said and done, you put 10, but 10 barrels back there to rest, you may only come out with, you know, four, or maybe if you're lucky, five barrels of whiskey left to, yeah. to blend together, to make that, that age statements, that, that age statement bottle. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Uh, does anybody know the other phrase that we use for lost whiskey during the process? There's two of them. We have the angel share and there's another one. Devil's cut. It is. It's the devil's cut. The devil's cut is what's lost to the wood. Uh, so within every barrel, uh, if you take a stave out of a barrel and you look at it, there'll be a line uh, where of how far the whiskey made it into the wood. We call it the red line. So when you talk about a whiskey redlining into the barrel, you can see how far through the wood it got. And some of it can go all the way through on a particularly porous wood, like a cedar or something like that. But uh, the whiskey that remains in the barrel is called the devil's cut. And uh, Scottish distillers and distillers from around the world, regardless of whiskey, pay a premium for American whiskey barrels because they contain American whiskey in them. And that whiskey process, as they start maturing their own product through it, that whiskey will come back out of the wood as their product goes in and comes back out as well. And that whiskey complements anything else that's going on within the, within the barrels. So there's a, there's a nice complement to the American whiskey to a huge portion of the scotch market, 
a lot of rums use it and you'll get a lot of American whiskey built into rums. Um, even red wines, a lot of red wines will use American whiskey barrels and you'll get a lot of those, uh, those great whiskey notes onto a barrel. And yes, I'm sure most people on this call know bourbon barrel aging in beer has become a huge, huge, huge thing. So you'll get a lot of beers that are taking up or buying up American beer barrels or American whiskey barrels, and then not even recharring. They're just pouring their whiskey straight in on top, letting the char, letting the char ride and uh, letting their beer go right through and into that whiskey. Any other questions? Anything else I can answer for y'all? Cool. Well, I will make a couple of recommendations for you. So I already told you that we have an awesome distillery that's on site in downtown Main Street. Uh, about five years ago, Campbell Brown, the great, 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 great grandson of George Garvin Brown, uh, took over as the CEO of... Um, uh, old Forester, and he decided that he wanted to move the, the family, the distillery back to its original property. The original property was 117 Main Street in downtown Louisville, and uh, he was able to actually reacquire that same building and the building next to it. And of course, because Louisville is Louisville, they assigned us the address of 118 Main Street, so it is what it is. But uh, 118 Main Street is the coolest distillery tour you'll see when you're down there. Part of the reason for that is they have their own mini cooperage up there. So you can actually push the button to char a barrel yourself. It's really kind of a cool thing. Uh, you can watch a, a cooper make the barrel and, and go through that process. Um, you can walk through the through a Rick House, uh, an on-site Rick House that is actually a temperature controlled Rick House. And it's a year round temperature control. We have some specialty barrels aging in there. You can see that and you can see the tasting room and and all the old brick and artwork and stuff. It's really, really a very cool distillery tour. Probably my favorite one, except for maybe driving through the horse pastures in Versailles at the, the, at the Woodford Reserve. That's a, that's a very cool one too. Uh, and then if you, ever, if you ever are doing that bourbon trail tour and you go down to Louisville, one of the things you have to do, and, it, and for the longest time it was not open to the public, but now it is, uh, you can actually go into the Cooperages now and take a tour. It's not cheap. And you don't get a souvenir and you don't get a tasting, but uh, watching the, the barrel process make and watching these coopers uh, do their craft and fire these barrels together in an eight hour shift, a solid cooper can make 300 to 325 barrels in a, in a shift. Wow. It is unbelievable watching these guys fire these staves into the hoops. It is, it is something else. And then just kind of watching the, 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 the toast and char process is really cool as well. Hey, are the barrels still going for about ten to fifteen thousand dollars? Oh heck, no, no, no! You can get an unfinished barrel. Uh, well, now a a barrel that's got whiskey remaining in it. That's no, I'm saying the full barrel from <laughs> Old Forester. Oh no, no, no! Uh, seven to eight, generally speaking, on a single barrel. Uh, that's retail. So I guess a fifteen percent markup on a seven thousand dollar barrel is. What's that? About nine thousand bucks, I guess. If you to to get it bought in the state of Michigan, uh, if you buy it in Louisville, if you were if you're able to, and it's we don't have as many barrels as as we'd like to. Trust me, as someone who has to answer the question every day, can I get a barrel? Um, we only get about eighteen barrels for the state of Michigan, and if you think about that, we're the largest control state in the country. So of the there's two types of sales in the United States: control state and open state. Um, 30 or 30 or so are open 20 or so are control uh we are the largest control state in the country for for liquor and uh we only get 18 barrels for the entire year uh to to sell out to our stores so um we getting a getting a barrels uh, getting a barrels a chore um through old forest right now you know you have better luck at someplace like will or uh, some of the smaller distilleries down in Kentucky have some awesome barrel programs. If, if that's your, that's your cup of tea. I got a buddy actually down there right now at the Willett distillery picking out a barrel. He just texted me and texted me and said, Oh, you're tasting this one when I get home. So I'm looking forward to that. I figured if I went down there, they'd play the drum as they rolled it out to my car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Thank you.
Anything else I can answer for you guys? Awesome. Well, you guys have been a pleasure. Thanks for the conversation and thanks for joining me for a couple of drams of whiskey. Uh, I think Ryan or Amanda will probably tell you in an email, email in a couple of days, but we're going to do a, a Father's Day toast with some scotches. So if you're one of those uh, who says, oh, I don't like scotch, give it a chance, first of all. It's important. Uh, but if you don't like scotch because of the smoke, I've got some surprises for you. You're not going to taste any peat or any smoke in three out of the five scotches or three out of the four scotches we're going we're gonna to go through. So I think then what's the point? Here. Well, listen, it's a, it's a reasonable argument, right? Uh, that that, uh, that Isla tradition is strong, but uh, there's some awesome whiskey to be had outside of those 13 distilleries that beat the hell out of everything, so. Well, I just want to say thank you, Brian, for everything tonight. Um, I'm going to let Amanda kind of wrap it up for us, but I just want to make sure I jumped on and thank you for everything that you shared with us this evening. Oh, 100% my pleasure, Miss Abney. Now... <laughs> Ryan's husband, I would like you to drag her away and make her go rest. Yes. Yes. Uh, and and she can pretend like she's working if she has to, but I really want her to, to, to go get some good sleepings now. Yes. It's important, and we'll uh, see you in about a month or so. Yes, thank you. I'm Cedric, by the way. Hey, Cedric. Nice to meet you, sir. Thanks, Brian. My pleasure, ma'am. Yes, thanks to everybody for coming in. We're really excited about the, you know, the scotches that we have coming up. Um, make sure you check out, you know, if you, you know, tag us or check out our social media too, because we always have new, um, the curated boxes from our Detroit Social Box Collective and then the boxes and kits that we've created, you know, with Brian and we have a lot of new things coming up. So we're pretty excited about all of that. Um, you know, we really focus on creating events that, you know, can happen really anytime. So pandemic or not you know we're really trying to create experiences that are new and different so we're really looking forward to having you all back so thank you so much and this video will be available we're gonna you know get it downloaded and recorded and we'll make sure to let y'all know where it's gonna be if you did want to um check it out because we did have a few people who couldn't make it tonight so thank you so much brian absolutely thank my you pleasure both. amanda thank, thank you, you so much for having me absolutely that rocked thank you